Actually, let me let me stop like in the, on the first slide. So in, in this kind of like brief presentation, I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the work that I and my collaborators have been doing about um, scalable equilibrium computation. So I'll talk a little bit as to what it means if you're not familiar and learning dynamics. Um, and in particular, like it will do, we'll talk about like learning dynamics and equilibrium in the context of multi-step imperfect information games. Right, so I will not assume that all of you know what a game is, uh, but if you're thinking about video games, you're not too wrong uh, in the sense that video games are games, but but this is not what the what the talk will be. So by games in this talk, I will mean games in a game theoretic sense. Right, so it's it's going to be like an abstraction of kind of like a inter interaction between agents, which are trying to maximize their own utility. Um, and you know, like with, with this formalism, you can call game even things which are not video games or board games or whatever, like whatever thing you're thinking about. Like for example, combat can, can be uh, called, you know, it can be seen as a game. Uh, like the game theory literature has, you know, like uh, a lot of examples of, of games between nations, for example, right? So like where you try to see how kind of like antagonistic nations would, would try to, uh, you know, just like solve an interaction. So. Keep in mind, right, that, that this will not be about video games if just, just in case, you know, like the, the first slide is misleading. Um, right, so I'll tell you a little bit about equilibrium computation and learning, but before, let me just like try to kind of like abstract uh, all the talk um, into just like one sentence. So fundamentally in, in this talk, I'll, I'll try to tell you a little bit as to uh, some of the efforts that people have been, made, have been you know, like have been doing uh, into trying to solve this question, that is, how can machines make optimal decisions under imperfect information and strategic behavior? Right, so imperfect information means that sometimes you have to make a decision and you don't really know the exact state in which your environment is. Right, for example, you might not be observing, you know, like what, I don't know, just like people behind like a fog of war are doing, for example. Um, and strategic behavior means that we assume that all the agents in this interaction are selfish and are trying to maximize their own utility, which means that they will not shy away from, you know, just like doing whatever is best for them, even if it hurts you, right? So people, like people or agents will just like selfishly maximize their own utility. Now, why strategic behavior? Well, it turns out that strategic behavior arises in many real life interactions. Um, one example that I like to think about is auctions and markets. Right there you have kind of like a, a system that, for example, could be an auction um, where uh, agents participate and the strategic behavior can arise when agents just realize, like bidders realize that if they lie about the, their evaluations of the items, then you know, like they can get away with making more profit for themselves, for example. Right, so big companies like Google and Facebook, they run huge advertisement auctions. And this is a real problem for them when they see that, you know, like uh, since money is involved, you know, like the, the bidders have incentives to kind of like, just like tune their, their prices that they're willing to pay. And this, you know, like is good for them, but overall is, is bad for the system in the sense that, you know, like it makes kind of like the market fluctuates because everybody's like trying to, you know, just like adjust dynamically things in the way that maximizes their profit. And the, and the kind of the, the, the prices in the market fluctuate, right? So this leads to economic inefficiencies. So There's like one example in which it's important to keep into account strategic behavior. Another example is fraud detection systems. There, you know, like the situation is uh, strategic in the sense that, of course, you always have people that want to protect systems and people that want to break systems, right? So you you have to strike kind of like a fine balance between security and friction for users like you don't really want to turn away users because there's like a lot of friction in a secure system but at the same time you cannot really open vulnerabilities otherwise people will exploit them so there's like another instance in which strategic behavior needs to be taken into account um, of course there's recreational games i talked a little bit about about that uh, in the first slide uh, this is a huge market i mean you know like it, it's good to have um uh, kind of like artificial intelligence, for example, for, for recreational games that, you know, like that drives kind of like a, like a, a big kind of video game market, but also, you know, like it's, it's good for uh, professionals to keep them, you know, like kind of like well-trained. Um, it's important to keep into account strategic behavior there because these games usually are strategic, right? Like if you take, I don't know, like uh, your favorite, um, you know, just kind of like competitive game where, you know, like, know, like League of Legends, for example, where there's like competitions, you know, like pe people are very well incentivized to do whatever is best for them. And, you know, like the, the whole interaction is all about, you know, just like, I want to win, right? So that is like another instance. Uh, let me just like mention another example, which is traffic control. Um, you know, like people 
like drivers are usually selfish, um, right? So you want to create a system that is efficient, but at the same time does not really allow for um, for uh, kind of like agents to kind of like break the rules uh, to their advantage. But you know, like more generally, I feel like this idea of keeping in the kind of strategic behavior is more pervasive than just like the examples that I that I gave you, in the sense that you know, like I, I think there's a strong argument that every time you deploy a system in the real world that makes decisions for, uh, like I just say, even like real people, um, and these decisions affect these people's lives and their economic in incentives, uh, you know, like that are at, at, at stake, then, you know, like people, if they find a vulnerability, they will exploit it. And, you know, like uh, as kind of like one ultimate example of why it's important to, you know, be able to model and reason about strategic behavior, I have like this kind of like piece of news from 2018, uh, where apparently more states had opted to create student essays by computer to just like reduce their load, right? Like they probably didn't have um, enough uh, graders. So they, they just like turned to like AI to, uh, you know, like provisionally grade essays. And, you know, of course, you know, like uh, when you uh, grade an essay for, for a student there, you know, like there's gonna be incentives for them to just like get the best grade because maybe they want to get into the, the school or, you know, like they just like want to, you know, just like not have to redo the exam, for example. Uh, so you, you can imagine what type of people started like playing with these robot grade systems until somebody found out that this piece of masterpiece, like this kind of like a long string of B would score the maximum. Um, and you know, like which which made the whole AI system kind of, kind of like completely useless, right? So that was like another instance in which it was important to keep into account the fact that uh, the the students had kind of like strategic interests in manipulating the system, right? Which I feel like is is a is a good way to to show how AI must be robust to adversarial adaptation and, and exploitation, and if it is deployed in the real world. And therefore, it's important to develop uh, like good learning and optimization algorithms for decision making that can reason about this strategic behavior. Right. So this is kind of like the, I guess, like the the the, the starting point, I guess, for some of the, the research that I'll be talking about. Now, there is a lot of research in uh, fields like online learning and computational game theory. They focus exactly on this problem of how do you compute, for example, like optimal strategies if all the agents are um, selfish or you know like are strategic and at the same time you know like how do we learn like say that we're like playing just just interactions in the real world many times like how do we learn uh, what the agents are doing and what is best like what is the best strategy um, right so so there is a lot of research about this but a lot of this research has focused on uh, decision making problems that are one shot and i will talk in a second about what it means um, but keep in mind that for this talk, I'll be particularly interested in a different uh, model of decision making, which is more expressive, uh, which is tree form decision making or extensive form game or extensive form kind of like decision making. Also, I will use the term decision making and game kind of interchangeably here uh, for, for this talk. It, they're not exactly the same thing, but I guess like for like by and large, you know, like for, for the purpose of this talk, will be, they will be the same thing. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what I meant by a lot of research has focused on uh, one shot interactions. So one shot interactions in the game theory literature are, are called normal form games. And fundamentally normal form games are games like rock, paper, scissors. Right, so what it means is that um, every player plays exactly once. They have to pick an action out of a like, finite set of actions. And the, you know, like after every player has picked an action, then kind of like a payoff for everybody is revealed that depends on the actions that were selected and interaction is over, right? So because we have a finite set of actions, uh, the, like a strategy in a normal form game uh, is just a probability distribution over actions. So say for example, like a strategy for a player in a game of rock, paper, scissors could be, I'm gonna play paper 20% of the times, uh, you know, like, uh, rock, so I guess like I, in the figure I have like rock 20% of the times, paper 50% of the times and scissors 30% of the times. Okay, so this is, this is what we mean by strategy in a normal form game, everything is very well defined. Um, it's called one shot decision making exactly because every player acts once and simultaneously. And you know, like, like I was saying, it, it's very well understood in theory and also fundamentally in practice, how to solve these games. Like if you need to solve, you know, like rock, paper, scissors, you know, like we have both analytic and computational tools that, that they can tell you that. But, you know, like I, I would argue that most real world decision problems do not look like a normal form game. Like they're, they're rarely uh, one shot. Also, I, I heard like some, some people talking, I don't know if it was a, like a question, like if, it, if it's a question, 
that definitely definitely stopped me. Um, but but I, I think that was just like background noise. So I'll just keep going. So right, so we were talking about normal form games and how um, they do not look like sorry, and now they they're kind of like uh, simultaneous and players only act once. But you know, most most real world decision problems do not look like a like a normal form game. Uh, and in particular, you know, like if, if you think about most interactions, there is both partial observability um, of the environment, and also like when when you know like when agents make decisions, you know, like they're gonna make a decision, observe something, and then make a decision again, right? So agents usually act more than once, um, and then you know like they have observability. So if you take these two ideas together, like acting more than once, so like like turn taking, for example, and uh, at the same time partial observability, then you end up with a different model. Of games, which is called extensive form games, right? So this is a different model of strategic interactions, and you know, just like um, just to use a canonical game. Uh, so for normal form games, we use rock paper scissors. For extensive form games, I will use poker as a perfect example. Actually, it's kind of interesting. Poker um, not only is kind of like probably like the most famous example of an extensive form game, but uh, you know, like there there's um, reasons to believe that when von Neumann kind of like started game theory. Poker was actually the, the game they wanted to solve, right? So like a lot of the game theory literature, at least like the, the non-modern one, like the classical one, uh, was born out of the desire uh, to play poker. And if you look at John Nash, you know, like the, the same guy as like Nash de Brea, the, the, the same guy from the from the movie, like the Beautiful Mind, um, he like he wrote that he's actually, he, he was, um, I think he was an undergrad here at, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and uh, like in his PhD thesis, where it kind of like basically starts a lot of the uh, like equilibria analysis, like in game theory, like he only has one application is his thesis, and that is poker, right? So like poker will not only be kind of like a, like an example for the slide, but historically it has been one of the kind of like influences or like uh, like motivations for uh, for game theory itself, and and the reason for that is that. Uh, you know, like if, if if you think about it, it's pretty cool that you can kind of like mathematically quantify what what is the optimal bluffing, right? Like you can actually solve uh, like how to play poker, including how to bluff optimally, right? Like I, th I think it's a uh, I think that that is why you know like uh, poker has always played this kind of like special role in, in game theory, and you know like some of the things that I will talk about in the stock go into the direction of you know like if you have like a huge poker game, for example, how do you computationally find the optimal bluffing amount or like how you should, uh, you know, just like play a specific end, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, um, right? So in, in the slide, I have a, a very, very small kind of like simplified version of poker. Also, if you don't know how poker works, like if you don't, if you never played the game of poker, it's all okay. Like uh, you will see like it, it, this example does not really require that you understand anything of, about the rules, but you know, like I, I have on the slide kind of like a, a small game tree which is uh, a simplified uh, game of poker and the way the interaction works. So this is from the point of view of player one, the, the game starts and they observe uh, their private hand, right? Like somebody gives them kind of like a secret card and this card can either be a jack, a, a queen or a king, right? So at the, at the beginning of this interaction, the player is there at the root and you see there's like this small X, this means that it's an observation point, uh, right? And the player will observe in particular, we'll observe whether their specific card is a jack, a queen, or a king. Now, suppose that the player observes that their card is a jack. This moves to a decision point now where the player needs to decide if they want to check or raise. Um, like, uh, so raising means basically putting more money into the pot. Um, checking means that basically they don't want to put more money. So let's just assume that they want to check. Then you see the, the process transitions again to uh, an observation point. And this, in this observation point, the player can observe whether the opponent uh, will check themselves or will raise. Now, if the opponent uh, raises, you know, like there's gonna be like more decisions to be made, especially like one other decision like X4. Um, but let's just assume for now that the player uh, checks, like the opponent checks, then in that case, you know, like we're out of the tree, which means that the interaction has, has finished. Like, so we have terminated our, our strategic interaction and we'll observe some payoff. For example, let's just say that there's a showdown and uh, we observe like that, you know, the, the player observes that they win $20, for example, right? So this is how an extensive uh, form game works. And, uh, you know, it's an incredibly general model of how an interaction with an environment works. And, you know, like I, I had poker here, but I could have used chess, I could have used Go, I could have used pretty much, you know, like 
any of the inter interactions that you think about, even just like video games, like can be modeled this way. Um, of course, like it, there's a question as to how big the, the like the tree will be, but you know, at least in principle, pretty much all of the interactions that you can think of are kind of like extensive form in that sense. Um, right. Also, like again, like poker is just like a recreational game, but there are people that use these models. For example, by like you know, like they they have security games where uh, instead of checking or raising as actions, they have protect one target, protect the other target, and instead of observing like a secret card, you know, they can observe some partial state about the environment, and instead of observing uh, like opponent moves, they observe, for example, whether they they see that. I don't know, just like an alarm goes off in a specific part of a building. And, you know, there's like fielded work about this that, um, you know, just like basically looks into how to protect airports, how to protect wildlife. Um, it's it's kind of like a, a deployed model. But, you know, like, I guess if we want to abstract from the specific applications and just look into the, the model, you know, like we can abstract everything that I said by just saying this. Extensive form games are games that are played on a tree. And this tree has two types of nodes. We have decision points where the decision maker has to pick one action from a set of available actions. And we have observation points where the decision maker observes a signal that is drawn from a set of possible signals. And you know, this is called extensive form or tree form decision making in the sense that decision observation points from a tree. Right? Like so, some of you at this point may be uh, familiar with reinforcement learning. So they might just say, hey, like I know about market decision processes. How is this not a specific case of that? Um, well, the important thing in kind of like this, this kind of like field of, of game theory or, you know, on, online learning where we have uh, multiple agents learning is that there is no Markovian assumption about the environment. In particular, what often happens in these uh, kind of like interactions is that all the agents are adapting and learning, which makes the environment non-stationary, right? So if you're familiar with like single agent reinforcement learning tools, those are not applicable to solving these kind of interactions. And I think at this point, it should also be clear that extensive form games are, uh, you know, kind of like these like three, three form decision making models are a generalization of one shot decision making models. Like, for example, you can always take uh, rock, paper, scissor and put it into, into uh, this formalism. In particular, when you have a one shot problem, you only have one decision point and, and nothing else. Right. So, so it's clear that. Uh, normal form gains are kind of like a generalization, but what is not clear is how much harder a generalization uh, extensive form games are compared to normal form games. Um, so I'll, I'll try to convince you that uh, extensive form games are not only a richer model, but a much harder model. And then we'll talk a little bit about what, what can be said in that case. Like if you remember I said for normal form games, a lot is known and they're basically solved both in theory and in practice. It will turn out that extensive form games are not like that. There's still like a lot of open questions. And I'll talk a little bit into some of the of the work that we've done to just like try to bridge the gap and some of the work that remains to be done. If you know, just you know, for example, like you might be interested in, in solving some some of that. Uh, some of those questions, right? So why are extensive form games much harder than normal form games? Well, there are like a bunch of reasons, but I feel like maybe uh, the first reason is that unlike normal form games, the number of strategies, in particular deterministic strategies in an extensive form game grow exponentially uh, in the game tree size, right? So if you have rock, paper, scissors, you have say three actions, then you have three strategies, always play rock, always play paper, always play scissors. Those are the three deterministic strategies. But when you have a, a whole game tree, uh, the number of strategies suffers a combinatorial kind of like ex explosion due to the fact that you have multiple observations and multiple decisions. And you know, like as a function of, of the say, like the number of edges in this in this tree, like the or or even like the number of nodes, you have um, an exponential growth in the number of strategies. Right, so this is like the first kind of like unique challenge that extensive form games uh, pose compared to normal form games. There is a second reason why extensive form games are much harder than normal form games, and that is the fact that because there are observation points, uh, the environment has some control over what part of the decision tree is reached. And that makes exploring all of the decisions, like decision space, much harder. Like if you have rock, paper, scissors, you know, and you want to explore all actions, you're in control of what action you pick. So you know, like you can just decide, okay, I'll just you know, always pick at least uh, like a little bit of probability. I would put always at least a little bit of probability on all the actions and that guarantees that over time you explore all the actions. But um, in extensive form games, you know, like if, if the, 
let's just say like, for example, like if, if your opponent after X1 always raises, then you might never see the $20 in the check, right? Just because, you know, like uh, you, you will not really know what happens when you check. Okay, so this makes exploration, which is kind of like one of the fundamental uh, kind of like tools that you need to use in machine learning, a little bit hard in extensive form games, and you have to take extra care uh, when solving these games. And then there's like a third reason why extensive form games are hard, which is the fact that imperfect information makes backwards induction and local reasoning not viable. Um, right, so this is a little bit, it gets a little bit tricky, but basically you, you can distinguish between two types of extensive form games. There are perfect information extensive form games, which basically are games like chess, where you always see the board. There's like no question about what kind of like secret state the environment might be in or the opponent might be in. Um, and then there are imperfect information extensive form games, where, for example, uh, in poker, you know, like you don't really see what uh, cards the opponent got. Right? So, for example, like in, in this slide, I had this small example of. Uh, and I said that, you know, at, at the top, you know, like at the beginning, there's an observation point where the player observes what card they have, but they only observe the card that they have. On the other side of this interaction, there will be another agent, like in, for example, player two, that will also observe what card they have, but not what card player one had, right? So excessive form games can like naturally encode this imperfect information. Um, and for this talk, I will talk about the general case of imperfect information, extensive form games, like the more general, harder case. Um, but when you have imperfect information, then all of a sudden things that you could do uh, if instead you had perfect information, like for example, techniques that are used in, in chess or in Go cannot be used anymore, right? So in particular, what you cannot do anymore is you cannot solve for the optimal strategy by just looking inductively in subtrees what, what is best. You cannot just say, oh, I have like two branches and the optimal strategy will need to be optimal in both branches, so we'll optimize separately. Right? This thing breaks when you have imperfect information extensive form games and it's a little bit tricky to explain the math behind why things break but i feel like it's going to be easy to convince at least that things are things need to break by looking at poker in particular so in poker everybody knows that if you want to play optimally you need to bluff and bluffing fundamentally means that when you have a weak hand for example like a jack here in the in the in the figure you will need to play as if you had a strong hand like for example a king and when you have a king sometimes you have to play like you have a weak hand so that you know like the, the other player is always kind of like not sure what you have, right? So imperfect information is a negative in the world, of course, like it's, it's, it's bad that you don't observe everything, but at the same time, it's also positive in the sense that when it comes to strategic behavior, you can use imperfect information that you know other agents have like for, for you uh, as kind of like a tool that you use to extract more value from the interaction, right? So all of this, is not something that happens in rock, paper, scissors, right? Like, like bluffing is definitely not something that, that you would ever do in rock, paper, scissors. Like it doesn't even make sense. Like what would it mean? But when, when you start having multiple decisions and partial observability, that all of a sudden becomes kind of like not only something that you need to understand, but something that you need to do yourself if you want to be optimal, right? So it's important for these kind of like AI systems that uh, you know operate in strategic environments to be able to reason and use misdirection as a tool. So, you know, like I, because of all these unique challenges, I, th I feel like it's not surprising that the complexity landscape in these more complicated excessive form decision making, like, like problems or games is much more nuanced than in normal form games. But, uh, you know, when I started my, my PhD, one of the, the, few, the first things that I said was that I wanted to work in this more complicated model compared to normal form games. Because, you know, like if, if you think about real world interactions, they, are, they do not look like, like rock, paper, scissors, but rather they look more like extensive form games, right? So despite, you know, like the fact that extensive form games are harder, I think it is necessary to tackle that hardness if, you, if we, you know, like want to eventually be able to bring computational decision making into the real world. And, you know, one of my goals has always been that of laying solid theoretical optimization algorithmic foundations around extensive form decision making. So I will, you know, like, I, I will just tell you a, a few things that, that I've done. I will not go into the details because, like, the, the math is complicated. And also, I will leave you, like, I'll, I'll leave it up to you uh, to, this, like, to ask me, like, if, if you're interested in one specific direction. But I'll tell you uh, a few things. So one of the things that, um, like, one of the questions that we looked at uh, in, in the past is, um, can we learn optimal strategic behavior for one agent efficiently? 
and look look at the, the specific verb here. Here I said learn, right? Like there are multiple ways in which you can find optimal strategies. You could use optimization methods. You could you know do a lot of things. But uh, in particular, I was interested in this question of learning, and I will talk a little bit about what that means. Um, the idea of learning is very simple. The idea is this: like by playing the same interaction repeatedly, can each agent gradually improve their strategies? Right. So basically, you just like build kind of like a system that has to like make decision in, in like in an environment that is potentially even unknown and you know at, at, at a minimum is like adversarial like we don't really assume that it's stochastic as so we assume that every time we, we do anything in the system the system will be in turn just like try to learn from us and just like try to do it next time the thing that hurts us or that benefits the, the rest of the system um, right, so we just inter we're going to interact multiple times with the system. Can we learn over time uh, what makes a, an optimal strategy? Um, and uh, the interesting thing that happens here is that not only the answer is positive, but I feel like the answer is pretty deep in the sense that it turns out that there exists algorithm that just like pertain to every specific agent, right? Like you can basically say, okay, every agent is going to learn in this way, like basically interact and then update some internal state as to, you know, like what it will do next time. Um, and there exists like algorithms that not only are efficient, but also over time guarantee reaching some form of game theoretic equilibrium. And this to me has always been very fascinating in the sense that it's a, kind of like a low hole to global um, Kind, kind of approach, right? Like you're basically saying every agent independently is gonna do these kind of like learning uh, dynamics kind of thing that is sensible for themselves. But you know, like if, if they do it for long enough, you can you can prove that globally all the agents will kind of recover a form of game theoretic equilibrium, like some form of like global optimality. Right. So this is like one uh, set of, of questions that we've looked into and that, you know, the rest of the community also has, has looked into. And, you know, like going back to the to the beginning of this talk, like to the, to the title slide, you know, I was talking about learning dynamics. This is what learning dynamics mean. Basically, like, can we just like update strategies locally for each agent in a way that globally we're learning some global notion of game theoretic equilibrium? Right, so this is some of the, the work in particular that I've done that I'm happy to uh, to, to talk about in, in detail. Like if, if, if you're interested, I mean, it's a little bit technical, but at least like the general idea should be easy to give. But it basically turns out that, yes, we can learn this game theoretic equilibria. And we've looked into different types of equilibria. We've looked into Nash equilibria um, for two players, there's some interactions. So for example, heads up poker and course correct equilibria for general multiplayer interaction. So it turns out that this local to global approach works for any multi-agent kind of like um, system interaction uh, right so it's not just like for two players or some even though for two players or some you recover Nash equilibrium which is usually considered to be the notion of optimality that you care about and for example Nash equilibrium is what has been used uh, so like a few years ago we, we hosted like a competition here um, between like at the, at the casino of Pittsburgh between some top poker professionals and like a, like a poker AI that uh, somebody from the lab had built. I was not really in, involved in the code there, but you know, like it, it, was, it was done in this lab and you know, like we won a lot of money against the top poker pros, right? So, and, and we did that by playing Nash Equilibria, right? So these kind of like technology is not just like a theoretical thing. I mean, we, we build systems that make decisions in the real world. And you know, like, and with, with that, we actually won a lot of money at the casino, uh, which I mean, I guess everybody always asks, can you do this online? Uh, it's not ethical, but also they have like strong anti-cheat kind of like thing. So it's not, it's not you know, like, a, like a good idea, but I, I could envision somebody asking. Um, and then the, the other equilibrium that we looked into was extensive form coordinated equilibria. This was a longstanding open problem. This is like the uh, kind of like the, the award that, the, that we got. And this was like in collaboration with people at Polytechnico and you know pe people here at, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, right, so, so this is like the first set of questions, like can we learn optimal strategic behavior for one agent and can we recover a global game theoretic equilibrium? Uh, there is a second set of questions uh, which revolve around the idea of can we learn optimal behavior for groups of agents, right? Like, so the first part, like part A was about individual agents, part B is about groups. And the reason for that is that sometimes you care about optimizing strategies for teams, for example, or you care about maximizing not just the utility of a single uh, player, but just the social utility, right? The sum of the utilities of all the agents, right? So 
looked into questions such as, you know, can we learn to play optimally as a team? Like, can we devise um, kind of like learning dynamics for teams that converge to optimal strategies for teams? Can we learn equilibrium that optimize some of the utilities of the players instead of looking at each player separately? Um, and, you know, like we, we showed that that is possible. And then in the third part, in the kind of like third set of questions that we looked into, uh, we looked into, can we optimize strategies in the presence of imperfect agents? So a lot of the assumptions of game theory usually is that the amount of adversarialness is maximum, right? Like the every every agent is infinitely smart and they will always do whatever is uh, best for them. Um, and it turns out that actually, it uh, that's probably very close when you play against top poker professionals. But when you play against kind of like uh, amateurs, for example, they will make a lot of mistakes. So like the assumption of like kind of like the, the reason to believe that Nash equilibria are optimal in that case kind of like don't really hold anymore. And there is like this, this overarching question as to what is an optimal strategy against an imperfect agent. And there's a lot of pages of literature in, in the economics, uh, kind of like literature in particular. Um, but, uh, you know, like some of the, the questions that we looked into in the past are like, you know, are all Nash equilibria equally good when the players are known to be imperfect and the answer turns out to be no. So then, you know, like uh, the next question is how can we compute Nash equilibria that are robust to mistakes at scale? So even if you don't really want to abandon the Nash equilibrium model, uh, still not all Nash equilibria are equally good. So there's like a question as to how, how can we do this? And again, like we, we build like a, like a big system, for example, that is able to compute these kind of like better Nash equilibria, which are called the refined Nash equilibria. Um, like at, at scale for the first time. So we were able to basically take something that had always been kind of like a theoretical insight in the in the economics literature and then turn it computational and um, you know just like make it make it like some, something practical. Um, so at, at this point, you know, like I I feel like I talked about a lot of the different directions. So I don't really uh, like I'm happy to talk about any, any of these. I don't know if, if there's like any preference. Uh, I'm also happy to talk about how we got here or, you know, like uh, what, what the future is. But I feel like this is like a, a good point. I feel like after giving you kind of like an overview of, of some of the, the questions that we you know, thought about in the, in the past to give you like a, like a chance if you have any, any specific question. I'd like to know a bit about your past, how you started your research journey during the bachelor and through the um, Olympiads of Informatics, how they help you for your career? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, happy to talk about that. Um, so I, I think I started doing the Olympiads because like, especially like the math ones, I think the informatics one came a little bit after. The math ones uh, came first. And that was because I guess I was lucky in my high school that, uh, you know, just like I, I, I don't know, just like started talking to the right people and, and they were really into that. And, you know, like they were meeting in the afternoon and, you know, like I started going and, and they liked it and, and they liked the, the puzzles, you know. Um, I think that the Olympiads were like, were, were useful at the time, just like both to meet more people and go really beyond the kind of math they do in high school, which, you know, it's, it's kind of like, limited in, in many ways, um, right? So it, it was nice to meet other uh, passionate people. In terms of like whether, you know, like the kind of math that I learned to do for the Olympiads were, like was useful to actually do research or, you know, just like for whatever, like, uh, I don't know, like work as a software engineer in Google or as a research scientist in Google. Um, I don't think so in the sense that like, I feel like a lot of the the specific kind of like tricks that you learn for, from the Olympiads are very, uh, tailored for the Olympiads themselves. Um, part of it is that also I'm not like a mathematician. Maybe I'm like, but I would imagine that even like real math is like very, very different. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like I feel like those Olympiads really teach you some of the thought patterns that are very useful, right? So in terms of like specific techniques, maybe not really useful. In terms of thought patterns, very useful. Like I feel like it's good to be kind of like exposed to in a way like the construction of math, not really like the, the details, but just like the way math arguments are formed uh, during high school. And I think probably like the, the most useful thing that the Olympiads gave me was, you know, just like the environment, like the people, people being passionate about this, um, feeling like having something beyond, you know, like like high school, I feel like that, that, that always been fun. Plus, I mean, I used to go like, go travel during high school, you know, like it, it, it was nice to just like not have to do like the history tests or whatever every once in a while. Um, so, so I would say that, 
so yeah, overall, I mean, like, overall, I think they, they were very useful as kind of like a, like a, a tool to, to grow. Um, the specific tricks that like, uh, you know, like for example, like say, say that somebody is really like, is really interested in like the environment, but like is not particularly good at learning how to use, I don't know, like uh, whatever, like lifting tricks that are used at IMO, right? Like it's okay, right? Like you will never use them like uh, in, in, in your real life. I, I think like the important thing is Kind of like the, the thought patterns and and you know like that that is useful i think i think the specific details are a little bit less but i i don't know that i would i, I don't think i would be here without the the olympiads uh in the sense that you know like the environment and meeting the people that knew other people that could point me in the direction of where the opportunities were i think that was really invaluable and you started your journey uh, research-wise during the bachelor right How yeah yeah bachelor? so i did I, I did the three years of, of undergrad in Politecnico and then I moved here for a PhD. Um, the, the, the way that happened actually was a little bit random in the sense that uh, I, was, I was taking a class, which I mean, was, was one of the mandatory classes, right? Like we don't really have, like we cannot really build our own curriculum. At least that was, that was true when, when I was in, in Politecnico, but I, I would imagine nothing has changed. Um, right, so I, I had, I think it was like a class on scheduling or something like that, like uh, scheduling for real-time systems. I, I was doing control engineering, so we care about real-time systems. Um, and the, the professor that was teaching the class, Nicola, um, he, you know, like was not really like, a, like in control theory, but uh, he turned out to be, you know, like in, in game theory. Um, and you know, like the, the reason why we started talking was, and I think I think there was like a like a mistake in, in the book or something. Like there was like there was like a theorem in the, in the book that was false, and uh, and I think and I think it proved that it was false because I you know I was I was like try, trying to go through the book, I was like this doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then I, like I found like a counterexample, uh, and and so I went to him and I was like you know like oh, what's up you know like what's up with this thing, and uh, and he was like oh wow okay, and then. We wrote like an email to the to the author of the book, but then I, I think I think it was I don't know I think it was impressed with, with the fact that I found like the the kind of example. So it was like you know like, you you want to work with me, and they said no actually at the time you know I was saying like, like you know like I, I wanted to spend time with my girlfriend and you know I, I did not really know what research was so I, so I said no, um, but then you know like I guess like a few months later I was like hey you know whatever like you know I. I am getting kind of like bored with the other courses. You no, know, is, is there like a chance that we can still try to do something? And so he, I mean, he was really nice. Like he took some of his time to teach me some of the foundational kind of like things in game theory because I didn't know anything about game. I didn't even know it existed basically, uh, right? So he taught me a little bit about uh, like auctions and about uh, games. And, you know, we, like he gave me like a couple of problems that he was thinking about. And then, I don't remember. Like I, th I think I think anyway. Like I, th I think I like approved something and I implemented some algorithm that he had in mind, and it turned out to work well. And then we improved it together. Um, so it was like, okay, why, why don't we write a, a paper? And and you know, like I like we, we wrote the paper. We submitted it to a conference, and then the paper got in. And then it was like, well, you, you seem to really like doing research. Why don't you you know just like go to the conference and and present the work and uh you know maybe like talk to people and so at the conference i i met uh thomas who's my advisor here and we like we were like chatting and and you know like it was, it was clear that we had like similar interests for, for things so then i applied to samu and, and then i got here but i feel like without nicola i wouldn't have i wouldn't have known what a phd was and i wouldn't have uh ended up at, at, at samu also because i didn't really know what pittsburgh was. like if you had asked me like where is pittsburgh i would have said in germany <laughs> uh right like it, it's very german sounding um, so, so I didn't know that, that it existed. I didn't know that CMU was such a great school. Um, but, you know, like, I, I feel like with this guidance, I, you know, like the, the steps make sense, but without, without him, I don't think I would be here. What's next? What's next for me? Yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a good question. I, well, I mean, it, it, it I guess like it's, uh, it's a good question in the sense that it's like a hard question, but it's it's a hard question for, for good reasons in the sense that, um, you know, like I, I feel like it's, it's only up to me to decide what, what I want to do next. I, it's, it's not hard to go from a PhD to like a research lab in industry. Like for example, uh, I don't like Google or, or Facebook research uh, or Amazon research or, you know, like MSR, like 
bunch of research. Uh, they have like all these like huge labs and they pay very, very well. I mean, especially like in the US, I feel like the the market is very different from uh, from Europe, right? So like the, the salaries, I mean, you, you can go on levels of FYI and, and see, but like we're talking about, I know like, I guess like the minimum the minimum salary I heard of was like three hundred thousand a year, right? So this is like a, a incredibly lucrative. Uh, plus, I mean, lately with COVID, there's like a lot of chances to work remotely. So it's it's a very you know it's like lucrative and you know like in, in interesting path it's where you don't really get. Was that? It's very attractive, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. I mean, it's it's like being a researcher, but without having to teach classes or have to write your grant applications. Um, so, so I mean, so that, that is like one path I feel that a lot of people pick and one that I'm considering. Um, there's also the academic path, uh, which means, you know, just like uh, moving to a, like a, like a school as a prof assistant professor, and then you know, just like building your own lab and, and, you know, like, you know, just like teaching classes, designing classes. Um, and I feel like the academic system in the US is a little bit different from the academic system in, in Europe. So it's not really easy to, to compare, but I, I feel like as, as a deal, it's, it's also like a very good deal. And it's it's also, I mean, it's not as lucrative, but you know, like it, it definitely like it is not, it's not a bad career path. Uh, way less money, of course, but, but at the same time, maybe more freedom being less tied to uh, market events, right? Like if, if Facebook goes down by like 50%, you know, like I guess it went down by 40%. So no, not even that, well, that far, but, uh, Right, like you're, you're like usually universities are not quite as sensitive, and environments are usually very nice. So I, I'm actually considering that too. Uh, right, so I have like some offers, like like for both. I th I think uh, maybe what will happen is some something hybrid. Like I feel like it's not really a dichotomy. Like people can go one two years to industry and then go back to academia. Uh, so so I I, th I think it, I think it's definitely possible that that I'll that I'll end up doing that. Uh, you have said before something about the relationship between reinforcement learning and extensive foreign games. Mm -hmm. You said that the main difference is the absence of the non the mark assumption. Mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed that some of the words you use, like partial observability, uh, online learning, as, are also quite common in reinforcement learning. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious about the overlap of these two research areas areas one more close to classic machine learning and one more close to algorithmics and game theory itself yeah that's a good question i mean i feel like well first of all like also what reinforcement learning means is like a little bit uh, changing with time right like now i think a lot of people are looking into multi-agent reinforcement learning so what i'm talking what i'm talking about is multi-agent reinforcement learning right like it's uh um, you can also say that my work is reinforcement learning, but in the multi-agent reinforcement learning sense, I feel like a lot of the time, like many times when people say reinforcement learning, they mean single agent reinforcement learning, like for example, you know, like MDP, Q value iteration, you know, like all that, all that stuff. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, like the overlap and, and why a lot of the, the terms are the same. I think, for example, like if you take partially observable, um, uh, like, uh, you know, like MDPs, like POMDPs, um, right, they are single agent problems, but with partial observability about the environment, right? So the idea that the environment is partially observable is independent, is in a way like orthogonal, it's kind of like independent from whether or not the environment also happens to be adversarial, right? You can have some stochastic environment that uh, is partially observable or some adversarial environment that's partially observable or some adversarial you know, environment that is not partially observable and then you end up with chess, for example, uh, right? Where like everything is perfectly observable but you still have other adversarialness. So uh, the fact that there's a overlap of terms, I, I, think, I think that's not surprising. Um, in terms of like how this research, you know, like overlaps, uh, Reinforcement learning, I would say this research is multi-agent reinforcement learning, like solidly. Uh, it's, it's just that multi-agent reinforcement learning as a field is new, right? So, and it kind of like borrows the name from reinforcement yeah. learning, but it's, it's, it uses different techniques. Yeah. Well, to, to a master's student in Italy, what would you suggest um, to do, for example, um, what to focus on for a research career abroad? Interesting. Okay, I feel, okay. So this is like a very complicated question in the sense that I feel like I, I really only know what I did and what worked for me, and I don't really know um, how to generalize easily from, from there. But I can tell you, I guess, like 
how I would think about approaching like the problem. Like if, if it was me going back in time with, with the knowledge that I gained uh, at this point. So I feel like, well, I guess like in my case, I always knew what I wanted to do. Like I, I like I guess like after I met Nicola, I I knew that I like game theory. I mean, I I'd always been interested in in uh, um, optimization and statistics. So I I knew like I was always interested in in those two kind of like math fields in general. So I was I was only looking for like an excuse to apply them. Um, and game theory, computational game theory, I feel like has or like multi let's just call it multi agent reinforcement learning maybe. Um, but I feel like has a um, a perfect kind of like uh, intersection between all of these fields. Like there's like a lot of optimization, there's a lot of like learning, there's a lot of statistics. So I kind of knew what I wanted to do, which which meant that at that point I just had to basically figure out what was a good place uh, to do what I wanted to do. Um, and you know I didn't know what CMU was at the time, uh, so clearly like it, it was not I was not in the optimal condition. But um, had I known what CMU was, I think it wouldn't have been hard to. Uh, just like go around, see like what labs, like, you know, like write the papers that I'm reading that, that I think you know, are like meaningful. Uh, there's like a lot of noise always like in, in, in the literature, right? But like you can usually kind of like see what groups kind of like, you know, like if you just look at more than just like one year, but like, uh, like two or three, four years, you can usually see what the, the active groups are that kind of like consistently uh, work on the problem and, and, and make progress. Um, so I think I think it's like I feel like as a first step probably makes sense to figure out what lab you would want to be in, um, and then I think at that point there's like multiple things you can do. But I mean you can always reach out uh, and maybe just do some form of like internship there as well. Like many groups allow that. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can start uh, like you can try to find like a project that kind of like gets you as close as possible to the topics of, of the lab where you want to be. And then I feel like for a lot of the admissions here, it's very important that, or like maybe not very important, but it's, it's important. I know, I don't know about the very, but like this is just like important to have some publications uh, or even better like to have like people that can write you letters or recommendations that uh, say you know, like this guy is interested in this and you know, like uh, he's been, doing work on this and blah, blah, like this, this lab would be perfect, um, right? Like if you have somebody higher up that just like sent, they can write that for you, uh, that is useful. And at the, at the time, I guess like Nicola did it for me and, and like it was very kind and you know, like he, he actually came up with the idea of like, why don't you know, like you, you apply there and I can write a letter for you. A lot of the system here, at least in the US, I only know kind of like the way it works here in the US, uh, but like the, the letters are very important. Um, especially, especially if you like, if you want to go from a bachelor to, to PhD, where, you know, like you, you've had less time to, uh, do research. Um, so I, I feel like that's, that's important. The, the other thing that always works as a, as a general rule of thumb in life, I think, is that if you've met the people and you know them and they know you, I think this gives you a huge advantage compared to everybody else. Just, just because, I mean, it. I don't even think it's like an unfair thing, right? Like I, at the end of the day, like if, if you meet with somebody, you have a discussion about research and they seem clearly interested and, you know, like it, it kind of like builds some relationship that that is, is like, is like, you know, important to like to both parties in a way, right? Like you, you know that, uh, you know, like you met the other person, they're like, they seem like mentally stable and not murderers. And, you know, like the, the other side has seen you and, you know, you had like a productive conversation about research and it seems like, both sides are interested and both you know like both sides know what they're talking about i feel like that usually gives you gives you like like a big advantage right like if you can meet the people maybe at conferences i definitely did that uh before i applied to the phd and uh i think it was like my second year of of undergrad i think it was like there was like a conference in phoenix in arizona uh, so i went there and there were like a bunch of people and and some of the people that i met there for the first time you know like i met them the other day right so it's and they're like from like diff different labs and but you know like once you get to the conference you meet the people at the posters and you know it, it's just like a way to kind of like step into that kind of world like effectively so i think if, if you have a chance maybe go to the conference meet with people uh also i would say like don't be afraid like i feel like there's always like this this view that the the PIs like professors are like very busy and that's definitely true but at the same time they need the students to keep their lab going right so they're going to be interested in, in like meeting new people and when they go to conferences 
it's it like part of what they do is also you know just like to, to meet people and and recruit uh so i i i think like don't don't be shy like don't don't be afraid that you're wasting anybody's time i would just say just like be very proactive i, I think i think that's that's maybe the but at the end of the day i don't know what i'm talking about like I, i've only seen myself i you know like i I, I I knew what I wanted to do. I guess I was lucky that I went to conferences. So take take everything that I say with a grain of salt, of course. But but that would be my two cents. About uh, a paper or book recommendation that introduces to the intersection of uh, AI and game theory, if you have one. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question because for a lot of the extensive form um, game kind of like literature that I was talking about. I feel like it's a, we're, it's still a little bit too early to have kind of like a reference like that. So I don't think there's like anything that is too good. We actually we actually taught a class uh, last semester, uh, just like trying to kind of like you know, syst- like make things a little bit more systematic and and you know like um, put everything in like most things in in one spot. And then we have kind of like presentations. We had like some people from DeepMind that came and talked about Alpha Star, like how to solve StarGraph, for example. I know somebody was mentioning deep learning, for example. Like, so I, I don't personally do a lot, a lot of the, the deep learning in, in game theory, but uh, there are people that do it. And, and we had like some interesting presentations about like systems that uh, do that. So you might find like as, as kind of like an introduction to, to, to the field, uh, this course kind of interesting. Uh, the the lecture notes were like my classes. The slides were my advisor's classes. So we we taught this thing together. If you want just like one book uh, that talks about kind of like online learning and games, I think there's a prediction prediction learning and games. This is a book by Chesabianchi and Lugosi. Uh, I think kind of like at the intersection between AI and game theory. But again, like this does a lot of um, uh, one shot type type kind of like interaction. So it doesn't really contain anything about, about extensive form games or, or, or tree form interactions. What, what are the industries that are currently using algorithmic game theory? Yeah, so I guess there's like DeepMind does a lot of things with games, especially the, um, the Canada Edmonton lab. And they have like a, like a, a big game, game theory uh, lab at DeepMind. Um, so, so Mark Langtot is definitely a person, and he does like uh, deep mind Canada. Let's see. Let's start looking up uh, people uh, on, on this call. Uh, he he was actually a, a lab mate of mine, um, and he does uh, you know just like, like applied game theory, and he's a research scientist at, at Facebook AI Research, and um, you know like he he's been doing a lot of like great work on actually like the practical side of how to build uh, the systems. Um, so this is like from the actual, you know, just like a game solving side, like in, in practice, uh, there are, I mean, I know there are like people that work with the government, but I guess it's hard to, to get to, to those places. But like, for example, uh, the military has uh, like some interest about like using this to model whatever, like basically using multi-agent reinforcement learning to model like interactions, uh, even though I, can, I guess it's like a little bit harder to apply to, to those kind of positions. Um, otherwise, there are groups that use algorithmic game theory, but not in the sense of computational game theory. I feel like algorithmic game theory and computational game theory mean slightly different things to different people. Um, I would say like, for example, my work is so, like solidly in the computational game theory part. Like I actually care about computation within game theory. Like how do we compute this equilibrium? How do we, you know, like uh, solve interactions, stuff like that. Algorithmic game theory it's a little bit different. It's like a little bit more theoretical and a little bit broader in a sense. Like they do auctions, for example, um, they do markets uh, in a way like that. That is not, you know, like for example, like too close to what I do, even though I've in the past I've worked on like auctions, for example, and even like with Nicole, I Polytechnical, we did like a paper on auctions. Um, I feel like if, if by algorithmic game theory, you actually mean like the algorithmic game theory, like that, that kind of like broader thing, then the number of companies uh, grows even more because like then Google has ad auctions, Facebook has ad auctions, uh, Amazon has the marketplace, uh, and you know they have huge problems around you know like how to keep you know just like the prices from fluctuating, how to design the auctions, how to set reserve prices for their users, um, you know just like questions like algorithmic game theory also often deals with social choice, right? So. Uh, questions about fairness, for example, like how to allocate things in a fair way. And, you know, like if you think about it, like Facebook has the marketplace as well. Amazon has like 
you know, like the, what is it called? Like anyway, like the, the, the equivalent of the marketplace where like users can sell their own items and there's a lot of kind of like economics and, and game theoretic and kind of questions there, right? So like, if you actually just mean algorithmic game theory in a broad sense, I feel like all the big internet companies have research labs that do algorithmic game theory. Um, like, so I, for example, like I've, I've been interviewing with, with many of these and yeah, all of them, for example, like pretty much all of them have auctions that they care about. Um, right, so at a minimum, you know, like if you care about auctions, there's there's plenty of work uh, there for that. Um, but if you only mean like solving games in particular, just like uh, learning dynamics for games, then I would say Facebook and DeepMind are probably the best places. Um, and beyond that, I would need to think a little bit. But but there's definitely interest. Oh, I guess like and then the military applications, but those are hard. Thank you very much again, Gabriella, for uh, accepting the invitations giving this great talk and uh, congratulations again for the terrific research. And uh, I guess thank you also to all the audience. So if you want to stay updated, I guess follow the diffusion on social networks. If you are Italian, uh, you can also go to our website where we've opened the applications for next year court of mentees. So uh, send an application to join the community and uh, yeah, have a great uh, afternoon, evening, uh, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Hey, thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.